dear friends, Allah Pa. 23rd May, 1844. It was a dark time for many people. Injustice, corruption, and bigotry were widespread and endemic in the fabric of society. As a result, the longing and heightened anticipation of some was increasing. They were looking for an answer to their prayer. They wanted justice, tolerance. They were searching for their Lord. It was this spirit that animated the immortal Mullah Hossein to find the Bab. The conversation between the two was a symbol of the conversation of humanity with its creator. All those who sought answers to their questions were heard and given a chance to arise and pave a new path for humanity. That night, a spiritual force was released in the world, a force which, as the Bab has written, vibrates within the innermost being of all created things, and which, according to Baha'u'llah, has, through its vibrating influence, upset the equilibrium of the world and revolutionized its ordered life. Such a force, released by almost 50 years of continuous and progressive revelation, inaugurated by the Bab, culminating in Baha'u'llah, anticipated and extolled by the entire company of the prophets of this great prophetic cycle, found in Abdul Baha, the master, its purest channel and expression. Everyone found a refuge in Abdul Baha, irrespective of the race, color, or creed. The shadow of his protection was a shelter for all mankind. And when he was suddenly gone from their midst, a sense of emptiness pervaded the body of the believers and his admirers in the Holy Land and the world. Despite this, his funeral, his spiritual influence was palpable. In the words of an admirer speaking at his funeral, know of a certainty that he will live forever in spirit amongst you through his deeds, his words, his virtues, and all the essence of his life. We say farewell to his material body, which vanisheth from our gaze, but his reality will never leave our minds, our thoughts, our hearts, our tongues. Shoghi Effendi assures us that his passing could neither impede the operation of such a dynamic force released by the twin manifestations, nor obscure its purpose. But Abdul Baha left a plan for the believers. They were not abandoned to their own destinies. He delineated in his will and testament a framework to enable the believers to raise up the institutions designed by Baha'u'llah for the protection of his cause and the advancement of civilization. The will and testament was written in Abdul Baha's own hand. It was signed and sealed by him. It consists of three parts, written at different times between 1905 and 1907, when he was living in the house of Abdullah Pasha. It was a period when the constant machinations of both internal and external enemies that had brought fresh afflictions and every breath throughout his life now reached a climax and threatened the very life of Abdul Baha. It was during these troubled times the beloved guardian says, the most dramatic period of his ministry, when he, with inexhaustible energy, 
marvelous serenity, and unshakable confidence, wrote the will and testament and addressed it to the trust of Shoghi Effendi. With the passing of Abdul Baha in 1921, the heroic age of the faith drew to a close. With his will and testament, Abdul Baha not only ensured continuity of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, but created a link between the three ages of the dispensation. He closes the heroic age, inaugurates the formative age, and leaves an instrument that will guide humanity into the golden age. In the words of the Guardian, the will and testament should thus be regarded as the perpetual and indissoluble link which the mind of him who is the mystery of God has conceived in order to ensure the continuity of the three ages that constitute the component parts of the Baha'i dispensation. Friends, through his will and testament, Abdul Baha creates a direct connection of our souls and minds with the heroic age. In fact, many other passages where Abdul Baha calls us to remember the sacrifices of those thousands of martyrs who have, as he says, shed streams of their sacred blood in this path. He proclaims the twofold character of the mission of the Bab, discloses the full station of Baha'u'llah, and asserts that all others are servants unto him and do his bidding. With this powerful connection, we inherit blessings of the past and more. For the believers at the dawn of the formative age, just like us gathered here together, the will and testament opens the path for building the institutions of the faith that act as channels for carrying the spirit breathed by Baha'u'llah upon the world. He creates a bridge so that we can carry on our shoulders a portion of the work accomplished before to deliver it to future generations. He forever connects us with the streams of souls who were, are, and will be actively participating in the building of a new world. Friends, be it in the formative or the golden age, we are as one soul. This vision creates the connection both personal and institutional that we all have with the Master and the Will and Testament. As we said earlier, the mighty force of Baha'u'llah's revelation found in Abdul Baha this chosen channel to receive the revelation in its purest form. The words of Shoghi Effendi make us almost visualize the encounter of that force with the Master and the genesis of the Will and Testament. Shoghi Effendi says, the creative energies released by Baha'u'llah permeating and evolving within the mind of Abdul Baha have, by their very impact and close interaction, given birth to an instrument which may be viewed as the charter of the new world order, which is at once the glory and the promise of this most great dispensation. The will may thus be acclaimed, Shoghi Effendi says, as the inevitable offspring resulting from that mystic intercourse between him who communicated the generating influence of his divine purpose and the one who was its vehicle and chosen recipient. The will and testament is also clo closely connected with the Kitab Yaqdas, which Shoghi Effendi refers to as the brightest emanation of the mind of Baha'u'llah, 
as the mother book of his dispensation. He says that the provisions of both these documents mutually confirm one another and are inseparable parts of one complete unit. Both documents contain a significance and wisdom that will unfold only with the passage of time. The design conceived by Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Yakdas efflorescence in the will and testament of Abdul Baha. We may view Abdul Baha as an architect who helped shape the institutions envisioned by Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Yakdas, such as the international and local houses of justice, the hands of the cause, and the Baha'i Fund. He helped us to see at the level of concept and principles the duties and responsibilities of these institutions and the relationship between them. To stay firm and steadfast on this path of unfolding the design of Baha'u'llah's world order into the future, the beloved master described that authority will be carried forward through the guardianship and the universal house of justice. Shoghi Effendi tells us that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha have in unequivocal and emphatic language appointed those twin institutions of the house of justice and of the guardian, a guardianship as their chosen successors. Friends, there is an account of a pilgrim that has guided me throughout my life. I've heard it many times from people who served closely with the hands of the cause. This pilgrim writes, one day, Shoghi Effendi was walking with me and suddenly asked me, since after the martyrdom of the Bab, the authority of the faith was passed on to Baha'u'llah, who succeeded Baha'u'llah? I said, Abdul Baha was the successor of Baha'u'llah. The guardian nodded and continued. And after Abdul Baha, to whom was authority transferred after the ascension of, of Abdul Baha? I said, of course, to Shoghi Effendi. He said, no. I then said, the guardian. He again shook his head. I then said, the Universal House of Justice. He again said, no. And I could see from his expression that he was disappointed with my inability to answer his question. <laughs> then he asked, are the friends not reading my letters? <laughs> the answer is clearly stated in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. It is divided into four parts, Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, and the fourth part is entitled the administrative order, which is the answer to this question. What Shoghi Effendi wanted to impress upon me was that the authority of the faith rests on the administrative order, which rested on two pillars the guardianship and the universal house of justice. We must recognize that the administrative order is a unique and wondrous feature of this dispensation. There has never been such a system for the guidance and empowerment of mankind. The twin pillars that support this mighty administrative structure the institutions of the guardianship and of the universal house of justice are bound to each other and to Baha'u'llah and to Abdul Baha. Each operates within its sphere. Shoghi Effendi says that they are complementary in their aim and purpose. Their common, their fundamental object, he says, is to ensure the continuity of that divinely appointed authority which flows from the source of our faith to safeguard the unity of its followers and to maintain the integrity and flexibility of its teachings. 
The will and testament of Abdul Baha has determined the sphere of responsibility of each of these two institutions to allow them to fulfill a common objective. Among the powers and duties, the guardian was designated as the interpreter of the word of God, and everyone should show obedience to him. And as for the universal house of justice, everything that it is not explicitly expressed in the text should be referred to it and its guidance followed. Our relationship towards these two institutions is clearly defined by Abdul Baha in the will and testament. Whatsoever they decide is of God. Whoso obeyeth him not, neither obeyeth them, has not obeyed God. Whoso rebelleth against him and against them, has rebelled against God. Whoso contendeth with them, has contended with God. Abdul Baha himself explains this concept during his lifetime. A believer writes, One night, we were in the presence of Abdul Baha. He made certain remarks regarding the universal house of justice which in accordance with his instructions are recorded as follows. He stated, take this very moment, should the Universal House of Justice be operating, I would have been the first to obey its decree, even if it should be against me. That body is under the shadow of the protection and shelter of the blessed beauty. Its command is the blessed command. Discuss this matter amongst yourselves so that it may not be forgotten. Speak of it to one another. Even make a written note of it. These twin institutions are a dynamic manifestation of the covenant. It is vital to recognize that the powers and duties of the Universal House of Justice are rooted in the writings of Baha'u'llah. He entrusts the affairs of humanity into the hands of this institution and says, the men of God's House of Justice have been charged with the affairs of the people. They, in truth, are the trustees of God among his servants and the day springs of authority in this country in his countries. In other words, in his covenant, Baha'u'llah created a permanent link between each individual, each community, and institution, and the Universal House of Justice, which can legislate and resolve any matters that are obscure and bring unity where matters could cause differences among us. This, friends, does not mean that we cannot have our own ideas or questions or a personal interpretation of the writings. The House of Justice ensures the unity of the community and protects the cause. It is the center towards which we all must turn. In this way, division in the faith is averted. It has been entrusted by Baha'u'llah himself to do so, in, our, in order for us not to witness again the division that humanity has experienced in the past. The will explains that another vital feature is the flexibility in the decisions and laws formulated by the House of Justice. As any of them may be abrogated by a future House of Justice in response to the needs of humanity, this is in keeping with the responsibility that Baha'u'llah gave to the House of Justice to supplement and apply his laws and act in according to the needs and requirements of the time. The House of Justice, although it does not interpret, it incorporates the interpretations of the Guardian and of Abdul Baha into its consideration of every matter and provides infallible guidance about how and when these principles and teachings apply. At the same time,
the revealed word of Baha'u'llah remains absolute and immutable throughout the dispensation. We must know then, friends, that the work of the House of Justice will forever benefit from the interpretation of the Guardian. So the indissoluble and permanent link between these two institutions is preserved and guaranteed, as well as their main objective to safeguard the unity of the community and to maintain the integrity and flexibility of the teachings. In this way, these twin institutions guide us through our fast-evolving society and carry humanity forward into a unified world civilization. How striking to think that the passage of time, contrary to any other previous dispensation, will not affect the system that Baha'u'llah has created. Under the continuous guidance of the House of Justice, new discoveries, new questions, new challenges will not become a cause of disunity for humanity, but rather a cause of its material and spiritual development. Friends, up to this point, we have explored some implications of the will and testament as the charter of the new world order and we have stretched our vista into the future. But now, let us go back in time, 100 years ago, and appreciate the journey we have made thus far. When Abdul Baha passed away, the cause of Baha'u'llah had by that time encircled the globe. In the words of Shoghi Effendi, its light, born in darkest Persia, had been carried successively to the European, the African, and the American continents, and was now penetrating the heart of Australia, encompassing the whole earth. How deep a satisfaction Abdul Baha must have felt while conscious of the approaching hour of his departure, as he witnessed the first fruits of the international services of the heroes of his father's faith. He departed serene and left to posterity a weighty document, the will and testament. He named Shoghi Effendi to succeed him and left him with the blueprint to continue our march in the unfoldment of the world order of Baha'u'llah. Crushed by his weighty responsibilities, among Shoghi Effendi's first thoughts must have been how to advance the processes associated with the three charters of the faith that he had inherited as the head of the faith, all of which deeply interwoven with each other, the will and testament of Abdul Baha for the development of the administrative order, the tablets of the divine plan for the spiritual conquest of the planet, and the Tablet of Carmel for the development of the Baha'i World Center, the spiritual and administrative heart of the faith. If this new world order was the grand design which the mind of Baha'u'llah envisioned, and Abdul Baha was its perfect architect, then friends, Shoghi Effendi was the master planner and builder that would bring it to life from design to reality. We know that a first step the Shoghi Effendi considered was the establishment of the Universal House of Justice. But it was soon apparent to him that this was not timely. A sufficient number of national assembly had to be formed first to create a foundation upon which to establish the crowning feature of the administrative order. And in terms of launching systematic teaching plans, while victories were being won in the teaching field, these were mainly achieved by outstanding individuals like Martha Ruth. The Baha'i community itself was not yet properly organized, and there was no administrative machinery through which to advance the kind of mobilization of spiritual armies envisioned by the master in his tablets of the divine plan. Therefore, 
For the first 16 years of his ministry, Shoghi Effendi assisted the Baha'is of the world to gradually grasp the significance and requirements of the tablets of the divine plan. The plan was held in abeyance while the administrative order took shape, after which communities were patiently guided to conduct national plans. By 1951, it was clear that another critical feature of the administrative order, in fact, one of the provisions of the will and testament of Abdul Baha, was now necessary to support the work of national and local spiritual assemblies. The time was propitious to appoint the first contingent of leading hands of the cause and formalize the appointed arm of the administrative order. And a few years later, Shoghi Effendi created the auxiliary boards to assist the hands as deputies. In the span of only 32 years, our beloved guardian put in place all the necessary elements to launch the first global plan, a 10-year world crusade. The response of the Baha'i world was unprecedented. Hundreds of families and individuals left their homes and like burning tor torches, carrying the light of Baha'u'llah, traveled and pioneered to the remotest corners of the world, many of them to places they have never been, languages that they did not speak, and cultures that they had never encountered before. During these years, the interplay between the two arms of the administrative order through the collaboration of emerging national and local assemblies and the expanding contingents of hands of the cause was an evident sign of the unique features of the world order of Baha'u'llah. And this was perhaps most evident when the Baha'i world unexpectedly and tragically lost its beloved guardian, the sign of God on earth in 1957. The manner in which the hands of the cause, designated by Shoghi Effendi as the chief stewards of Baha'u'llah's embryonic world commonwealth, were able to unify the work of the growing number of national assemblies, and indeed the Baha'i world, was a further proof of the power of the covenant. The unity and close collaboration between the assemblies and the hands galvanized the entire Baha'i world. Their unshakable unity in pursuing the path laid out by the Guardian was one of the finest fruits of this period and ensured the victorious conclusion of the Ten Years Crusade with the election of the Universal House of Justice. Following the election of the House of Justice in 1963, further signs of the uniqueness of the covenant of Baha'u'llah became evident. One of these is continuity. With the launch of the nine-year plan in 1964, the House of Justice inaugurated a series of plans that, as Shoghi Effendi foresaw, would extend over successive epochs of both the formative and the golden age. The unprecedented growth of the faith soon necessitated the further development and evolution of the administrative order. As in the absence of the guardian, it was not possible to appoint more hands of the cause, it became necessary to consider how their obligations to diffuse the divine fragrances to edify the souls of men, to promote learning, as well as their duties in relation to the protection and propagation of the faith would be extended into the future. Thus, the institution of the continental boards of councillors was brought into existence, leading to the establishment of the International Teaching Center which brought to fruition the work of the hands of the cause residing in the Holy Land, one of the provisions of the will and testament of Abdul Baha. This, friends, was another victory of our faith. 
through the network of counselors, their deputies, their auxiliary board members, and their assistants, the duties of this institution to stimulate on each continent the expansion and consolidation of the faith and to promote the spiritual, intellectual, and social aspects of Baha'i life was now reaching the grassroots. A system was in place through which the lessons learned in the remote spots on the globe could be now shared with the entire body of the believers and elected institutions, enriching consultation and stimulating learning. The stimulus provided by a well-coordinated interplay of relationships among international, national, and local institutions began soon to show its potentialities and release tremendous vitality at the grassroots. The faith grew in scope and influence, and a new element of Baha'i administration was established between the local and national level, again based on the provisions of the Will and Testament, the regional Baha'i councils. These were introduced to strengthen the administrative capacity of certain communities where the growing complexity of the issues facing national spiritual assemblies required this development. The establishment of these institutions was necessary to coordinate the work of the increasing number of local assemblies, area teaching committees, and institutes, which began forming at the grassroots in response to growth and the increased capacity of our community, and thus providing even further expansion and penetration of the faith within a population, in region after region of the world. The dynamism released by this development soon brought into greater focus the interdependence between all the components of the administrative order. As the machinery of administration was expanding in scope, its strength and authority was blossoming concurrently. The developments of the last 25 years are too numerous to recount. In pursuing the many facets of the work of community building, social action, and involvement in the discourses of society, individuals, communities, and institutions are growing at a fast pace in their capacity to make an effective contribution to addressing the problems afflicting society. Day by day, the spirit and teachings of the faith penetrate further into the fabric of society, reaching increasing numbers of villages, neighborhoods, cities, populations, which are now served by a growing number of local institutions and agencies propelled by the increasing demands of growth, the House of Justice will no doubt bring into being even more institutions. One such occasion, the most recent, and in response to the tremendous advancement in the field of social action, has been the establishment of a new world-embracing institution, the Baha'i International Development Organization, in, 19, in, in, 20, in 2018. These developments, friends, are expressions of the powers bestowed on the Universal House of Justice to expand and consolidate the institution of its administrative order. And are signs of that continuity of divine guidance that flows through the covenant of Baha'u'llah. But perhaps the greatest victory in the development of the administrative order has been to witness the maturity of all these institutions and the amount of love they shower on the populations they are serving. Shoghi Effendi notes, administration of the cause is to be conceived as an instrument and not an end in itself. Administrative efficiency and order should always be accompanied by an equal degree of love, of devotion, and of spiritual development. Both of them are essential 
And to attempt to dissociate one from the other is to deaden the body of the cause. The profound nature of the relationships that characterize the world order of Baha'u'llah became particularly evident, evident during the present pandemic. How many national assemblies and regional Baha'i councils arose and joined hands with the councillors to lead their countries and respond with agility to the needs of the population. Inspiring letters were addressed to the friends. National and regional teams were formed to respond to material and spiritual needs. Auxiliary bomb members collaborated closely with cluster agencies to address new challenges. Network of thousands of assistants have helped local spiritual assemblies to be more closely in contact with every household and family. The health and well-being of the entire population was their main concern. In a society that promotes competition and self-interest, that prefers short-term gains over long-term cohesion and unity, the relationships we are witnessing between the three protagonists of the plan, the institutions, the individuals, and the communities, form a stark contrast. The Baha'i world community is emerging even more visibly as a shining example of not only the nucleus, but the very pattern of that world order, which is the purpose of Baha'u'llah to establish. Friends, the beloved guardian said two things were necessary for a growing understanding of the world order of Baha'u'llah. The passage of time and the guidance of the Universal House of Justice. He also said, the will and testament of the master needs at least a century of actual working before the treasures of wisdom hidden in it can be revealed. Our presence here today, dear friends, a century later, as representatives of institutions of the administrative order from around the world, is an evident proof of the work done by previous generations under the guidance of the head of the faith. How blessed we are to witness the uniting force of the faith of Baha'u'llah through the presence of friends from diverse backgrounds, languages, and cultures, women and men from literally every corner of the world on this historic occasion. It is in moments like this that I call to mind Baha'u'llah's words that the soul of every prophet of God, of every divine messenger, hath wished to witness this wondrous day. And we are alive today. With this unique privilege comes a measure of responsibility. While none of us asked or aspired to serve in any Baha'i institution, yet we have been called by Baha'u'llah to do so. And I think, dear friends, that among our many responsibilities, one is above others. And that is to assist the communities and the individuals we serve to remain focused and not to allow the many forces that are tearing apart the fabric of society to distract us or, God forbid, influence the thinking of the believers. To do our utmost to fortify our connection with the covenant and the head of the faith in a way that nothing whatsoever will be able to shake our unity and conviction. This will require that the thoughts, the language, and the actions of those of us who serve in the Baha'i administration will need to reflect firmness, coherence, and deep belief. All humanity is disturbed and suffering and confused, says Shoghi Effendi. 
We cannot expect to not be disturbed and not to suffer, but we don't have to be confused. On the contrary, confidence and assurance, hope and optimism are our prerogatives. In the Will and Testament, Abdul Baha says, in these days, the most important of all things is the guidance of the nations and peoples of the world. Teaching the cause is of utmost importance, for it is the head cornerstone of the foundation itself. When we consider the magnitude of the transformation that is needed, we recognize that the spirit breathed by Baha'u'llah upon the world, as Shoghi Effendi says, can never permeate and exercise an abiding influence upon mankind unless and until it incarnates itself in a visible order. Through his administrative order, Baha'u'llah made that possible for each one of us to partake in the building of a new civilization. The global plans are the necessary vehicle to unlock and channel the powers inherent in each individual, community, and institutions towards the transformation of society. As the institutions of the faith gain experience, particularly in the context of their efforts to ensure that the provisions of the global plans are met. They become a powerful instrument through which the guidance of the head of the faith can reach the grassroots and kindle the spirit of individual and collective enterprise. One counselor was asked, why are the regions in this country so advanced? What are the friends and institutions doing more? The counselor smiled and said, they think about the faith every day. They are immersed from morning to evening in nothing else than serving the faith. They read the writings and think how to apply them. They read the guidance of the House of Justice and think how to apply it. No matter if they are at work, or with their family and friends. No matter what they are doing, they think about the faith. Nothing is more important for them than pleasing Baha'u'llah. And because of this, they become like a magnet. Their life is transformed, and others follow their example. It becomes an irrepressible movement and nothing can stop them, not even the pandemic. <laughs> Friends, the road we have been traversing till today, even though luminous, has not been easy. Contrary to a society that increasingly promotes passivity and apathy, we know that each step forward in the building of a new world order is hard won. And you know that very well, no? <laughs> so one of the greatest lessons that, we left to, that was left to us by the will and testament is that this faith grows and develops through a dialectic of crisis and victories. The mature acceptance of this principle is part of our belief. In the Will and Testament, Abdul Baha recalls the sufferings of Baha'u'llah in his own at the hands of the members of his family. What was his aim in doing this? We must keep in mind that in his infallibility and wisdom, Abdul Baha left us a document that would not only warn and protect the community immediately after his passing, but also provide guidance for the duration of the entire dispensation. He left us a document that had to last centuries. In this sense, the deviations of his unfaithful half-brother can be seen as a lesson. 
so that we today can recognize the methods of the enemies of the faith. The arguments and pretexts may change, but the methods are always the same. They sow the seeds of doubt, creating confusion and division. But Abdul Baha left us a warning and an assurance. A warning that no matter how persistent one's attempts to undermine the head of the faith, these attempts will fail. And an assurance that the faith of Baha'u'llah and his covenant are invincible and will always prevail. My purpose, he says, is to show that it is incumbent upon the friends that are fast and firm in the covenant and testament to be ever wakeful. Watch and examine are his words. In essence, we are called to stay vigilant. Each time we are confronted by a crisis, we become stronger and new lessons are integrated in the body of knowledge of our community. This process strengthens our immune system and prepares it to respond to future crises. We know that attacks are inevitable. And as those who would oppose our teachings become more sophisticated, they will also become more challenging. So our body needs to stay strong to fight new maladies. Abdul Baha offers us the solution. One of the most powerful lessons in the Will and Testament is about the nature of the relationship of our soul with the covenant, of which Abdul Baha was the perfect example. This relationship is not passive. It is not static. It evolves as we strive to nourish it. In the individual, the fruit of that dynamic relationship with the covenant is selfless service and firmness. In a community is the degree of the unity and fellowship. In the institutions is the ability to fortify the connection of the believers with the head of the faith. The House of Justice says, the writings are replete with the reminders to the friends that they will be strong, united, and protected to the degree to which they are firm in the covenant, and that without this, nothing can be accomplished. Dear friends, the destiny of the faith is to infuse the planet with the spirit of the faith and to build a truly prosperous civilization. But who is going to do it? An early believer had this same question. And he writes, at the end of the visit, we accompanied Baha'u'llah to the door as he went out. At one point, he signaled to us to not accompany him further. I watched from behind his graceful stature and the majesty of his walk until he disappeared from my sight. I was so carried away, and in that state I said to myself, what a pity, if only the kings of the world could recognize him and arise to serve him. Both the cause and the believers would be exalted in this day. But the following day, we attained again his presence. At one point, Baha'u'llah turned his face to me and addressed the following words to me with infinite charm and loving kindness. He said, if the kings and the rulers of the world had embraced the faith in this day, you people who never had found an entry into this exalted court. 
you could never have had the opportunity to attain our presence, nor could you ever have acquired the privilege of hearing the words of the Lord of mankind. Of course, the time will come when the kings and the rulers of the world will become believers and the cause of God will be glorified outwardly. But this will, will happen after the meek and the lowly ones of the earth have won this inestimable bounty. Dear friends, if you look to your left and to your right and in front of you, you will see those meek and lowly ones that have received that bounty. So I ask myself, what other bounty is greater than this, than dedicating our short lives to do our part, no matter how small, and be able at least to say, I have tried, I have tried with all my heart. These troubling times of humanity call us to arise with joy, with determination, with hope, to write the next chapter of the history of our faith. When tonight we commemorate his ascension, let us all unitedly ask Abdul Baha to make us firm in the covenant, to increase our love for him, and to give us strength to persevere in our efforts. Thank you.